How about that? Yeah. That's better. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I appreciate you coming out today. And I just want to give one quick note. Um, I, I have allergies. So if I'm sneezing, <laughs> out, I it's totally okay. So um, I do uh, much of the social media work for Robert Public Relations. And we have quite a few nonprofit clients that we work with. So social media, in some ways, is the same across nonprofit or for-profit organizations because your audience is the same. You know, nobody on Facebook or YouTube knows or cares if you're going to get a lot of money or no money. So many of the marketing tactics are the same, but you're doing it on a much, much, much smaller or non-existent budget. So I appreciate all the concerns and questions, and the good news is I think we're going to be able to get to all of them today while we talk. So, Social media for nonprofits. Um, here's what we're going to talk about today. Real quick show of hands. Who has a Facebook account for your nonprofit? Excellent. Twitter? Okay. Do it again. So, Instagram? Okay. Um, let's see. YouTube? Okay. Snapchat? Okay. It's all right. We'll get there. LinkedIn? Okay, gotcha. Good to know. Much of what we're going to talk about applies similarly across different platforms, and then towards the end of the conversation, we'll talk platform specific. So I'll tell you how to use hashtags on Instagram versus Facebook versus Twitter. This is a different technique and a different strategy. Before we get there, though, we really want to talk about um, what it means to have a successful long term social media strategy, consistency. I can't say it enough. And this is also one of the biggest concerns that nonprofit social media managers bring up when they're talking about worries that they have and problems that they have managing their social media. It's like so many people have said today, having the time to do it. Because if you're posting one great post every two months, no one is going to see it. If you're posting a few okay posts every week, a lot more people will see it. So you need to be consistent, just like you do in your email marketing. Uh, the more consistent and the more regular, the more you get results. Facebook changes its algorithms every day. Sometimes we think by throwing a dark blindfolded at a wall and seeing where it lands. One thing that always, always, always brings results is consistent content from the platform. So, how do you build your brand on social media, uh, engage your audience, and get them involved and get them part of your nonprofit, and in the end, either visit your location or give you money, because it doesn't do us any good whatsoever if we have just people following us on Facebook and no one is visiting us in our specific locations. So the first and the most important step it's going to be figure out who you are. Now, since most of you already have, does anyone here not have any social media presence yet? Okay. So whether you have one fan or one million fans on Facebook, you have a social media personality right now. There are a few different ways to approach who you are and who you present on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any other platforms. We're going to discuss a few of them and a few ways of just thinking through the strategy and the technique of your brand. So you want to establish your brand. Who here has a brand book or a marketing brand guideline book where you have your logos and your preferred fonts and your preferred colors? Okay, a few of you do. It's a big thing, usually a marketing or advertising agency will put one together for you. Follow-up question to that. Who here is familiar with Pinterest? Okay. Who here has used Pinterest? Okay. One thing that you can do that's really nice is you can create a self-done miniature version of a glossy, slick advertising brand book. It's called a brand board, and you basically go and you click the button on a bunch of things that you like, that look like you, that sound like you, and those all together combined can create a big brand for it. So these are just a few examples of these. 
When you're thinking about establishing your brand and creating your social media presence or confirming your social media presence, you want to write stuff down like, what kind of language do I use? What kind of language do my visitors use? What are the key words that come up over and over again when people are visiting my location? Those are your tag words. Those become important as people are trying to find someone like you online. So if you write down these keywords, these key messages, the, adver the adjectives that you use, uh, the verbs that you use, the colors that look like your building, this becomes sort of your brand, brand board. And this can help you shape what your social media pages and presence look like. This look familiar? So this is the Ford Cat Avenue plant. Um, you guys do, I will say, a fantastic job, and we've worked with them, uh, I have to admit, at Vermont PR for a while. But this is the iconic photo that Ford Cat uses over and over again in a great deal of their marketing. It becomes, after a while, recognizable. So between that and, say, the exterior photo of the brick building, You've got this red, this black, these grays. These are sort of the piquette colors. So if you have something that looks like your building, if you have a photographer who takes a picture and you say, that is our museum experience, you can use that repeatedly across all the different platforms. Use it in your profile pictures, on LinkedIn, and other areas. And this becomes a way of reinforcing to the people that are following you already, that you have an identity and are important and familiar. And also, it, it makes you become more recognizable as you go on. Now, you don't want to use just one picture all the time, but having a few that you circulate is always a good idea. All right. So the different social media personalities that are available. So this is what you sound like, what you look like, how you perform your activities and your interactions with your social media followers. There's a few different ways to approach it. Uh, one is as the expert. So as the expert, you are the one that shares who follows on this day in automotive history. Okay? They're an expert. They post something every day on this day in automotive history. Bob does that with Motor Cities in the weekly email. So you are an expert in this particular subject matter, and your stuff gets shared over and over again, and makes the rounds over and over again. So that's one way to do it. It's one way, especially if we're talking something on Twitter, if you become the person that shares the information, people will start coming to you immediately if they have a question. So say, you know what? I think I remember this museum posting something similar to this. Let me just go look. And maybe they'll message you. Maybe they'll call or maybe they'll actually show up and ask you this kind of thing. So that's one way to get content out there, content being, you know, the however many letter word, to get content, to get material out there and into the hands and to remind people that you're there. In the social media landscape that is out there, it is very, very crowded. And it can be very difficult for a nonprofit to establish themselves above the noise that is out there. One way to make yourself distinguishable is to be an expert. So this is a campaign that we had done a couple of years ago for a nonprofit called Global Detroit. And this was during the time when national law and regulations on immigration were completely up in the air. Um, so we positioned them as the experts. The Speakers Bureau that Mother Cities does, that's positioning themselves and yourselves as the experts. So if you do that, this is one way to get, social media is a little bit different from traditional media, but traditional media more and more is following social media. So if you get noticed on Facebook, you're gonna end up on the news. So that's one way to get attention and to get information out to the places that you want them to be. You can do that for, through a bunch of different ways, traditional or more, or less traditional, but this still is, you're the expert, you are the host of the information. You're the one that shares it with the others, with your followers. One other way to do it, slightly different tactic, be a social butterfly. Be engaged with everybody else on the platforms. So you can share other groups' posts. All of these 
that I hope by the end of the day, the very least that everyone is doing is following each other on social media and sharing each other's posts on social media. You're not, you're not in competition, you're in cooperation because Joe coming from Dayton, Ohio to any of the Motor Cities areas and any of the Motor City sites just wants to know about car history. He doesn't care about your particular building versus another particular building. He wants to know all he can. So you guys are your greatest assets. So share each other's stuff. Tag each other. Tag other organizations. If you're doing an event and you're promoting it on Facebook, make whoever else is involved in that a co-host. That boosts the signal by the number of that group's or that page's followers. Does that make sense? So if I'm hosting an event and I have 1,586 Facebook followers. My 1,586 people may or may not see that event, but if I'm hosting it at this museum and they have 6,000 Facebook followers, now 6,000 plus 1,586 people have a chance of seeing that. That gets ex exponential, that broadens your base out. Also, one thing that you can definitely do, uh, encourage people to tag a friend. I'm, like I said, Facebook, Algorithms change a lot, but if you have a picture of an event, a wedding, for example, at your venue, put a post up that says, tag your friend, tag yourself. This now means the person that gets tagged and the person that tags, all of their Facebook followers see it. So on Twitter, if you're talking about Twitter, retweet. It's a great way to put content out there to keep your name up on the top of that feed without having to create an entire post all by yourself. So this is cheating a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's a retail page, but I, I will say that Rachel and the Peacock Room do a fantastic job at being social butterflies. So Rachel, who is the owner of a women's boutique store uh, in Detroit, they bring, she's got something like 15,000 Facebook followers for a tiny little store. She's on the news all the time. And she does it by being a social butterfly, by hosting events, sharing others' events. You know, this doesn't really have a whole lot to do. You know, maybe one or two people might come into the store and ask about that bag that is shown, but it gets her name out there. And everyone is, I bet you any money that this woman who is pictured is just tickled that she got onto the Facebook page. One other way. Be a team leader. Your greatest asset is your staff, your volunteers, and your board. Use them. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I know everyone's having difficulty coming up with content. If you have a board of directors, these people have proven that they are passionate and committed and know a lot about your product. Use them. Have them send you stuff. Create a file that you to share a drive folder. Create something where you have content stacked up and stacked up and stacked up so that if you find yourself with an extra five minutes during the day, just before you leave it right after lunch, you can just grab it out of the folder, post it up there. That's your team. So by doing this also on Facebook or the other groups on Twitter, you're building on the expertise and the enthusiasm of the people that work with and around you. Make sure you are responding and sharing reviews probably just positive reviews, but make sure that you are engaging in that way with the people on your page. Uh, Facebook groups, another big one. Uh, Facebook groups, especially, especially for automotive history fans, Facebook groups work. It's a newish thing. Uh, Facebook groups have only been around for about a year or two that are connected with the page. But obviously, automotive history enthusiasts are extremely enthusiastic about this one particular thing. They also love showing off their cars. So you create a Facebook group for this passionate group of people who loves old cars, who loves looking at pictures of old cars, who loves going to see old cars, and you get the conversation starters that are doing the work for you. They're creating the content for you. And they're committed and engaged in it themselves. So, to build engagement over a period of time. So you've got your brand, 
you know what your look is, you know what you're talking about, you know how you are putting your face out there on Instagram, LinkedIn, all of these platforms. How do you get more people to see you? Algorithms, you, you have to be either a liar or really, really, really well paid to understand Facebook's algorithms because they change daily, at least. But over time, one thing that remains the same is shares get engagement. So when we're talking about the Facebook algorithms, we're talking about what actually gets seen by someone scrolling through Facebook on a day. I'm sure you've had an experience where you said, you know, I, I know I put this out, no one has responded to this post at all. Or a friend of yours said something on Facebook and you never saw it. That's the great mystery. Um, but one thing that we do know is that shares, likes, and views are different. So shares, most important, because that is A, building your audience, uh, and B, maybe pushing that, that post up to the top of the list, Twitter-wise, Instagram-wise. It's, you know, if you're already the prettiest girl in the class, it's easy to be homecoming queen. So if you already have a lot of, a lot of shares, then it's going to be seen more easily at the top. This becomes increasingly important with events. You can cheat the system a little bit by boosting posts. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into details. So you want to build your, your engagement in a few different ways. First, I want to give a caution out here. Remember what I said at the very, very beginning of the presentation, consistency is super important. You need to be consistent. If you know that you don't have time to answer your followers' Facebook messages, don't enable that feature. It is better for someone to have to email you or call you on the phone than it is for them to send you a Facebook message and you don't respond in four hours. The vast majority of people that interact with Facebook polled have said that they expect Twitter even quicker, uh, but Facebook, they expect a response to a message from a business page within four hours. Now, that's at eight o'clock at night. If you aren't gonna be checking your Facebook page for that, don't enable it, that's totally fine. Make sure that you are committing the time and the energy that you have to the end product because that keeps you consistent. There are other ways to engage with people than that. Uh, if you know you're not gonna be able to keep up posting six Facebook posts a week, then don't start with six a week. Start with three a week. See where that gets you. Yes? Dumb question, probably. But if you don't use Messenger on Facebook, how do they contact you? If your website is listed, they do it that way. Um, I manage the social media, we'll talk about them for a little bit later, uh, from Animal Shelter for several years. And we disabled the feature because the vast majority of questions that people were asking were, is this dog available? We don't have that information. What are your hours? That's available on my website. Uh, or it's something that, that could not be answered via Facebook Messenger. So, so long as you are pointing to where the answers are, put your phone number up there, broad, big. Uh, we're gonna talk about that with events. Make it big, assume people are stupid or at the very least distracted. So if you, can, if you don't have Messenger uh, enabled, make sure that your phone number is up there, big, big and clear. And also be authentic. You know, we, we'll read a little bit more. You saw Rachel's post, that's her own voice. Use your voice, you're a real person. The trend more and more on every platform on social media that we're seeing is for a more intimate, conversational. Everyone is looking more towards personalized experiences, and that translates to Twitter and Facebook. So you can be an expert, but not be super formal. You have to keep in mind that even if you have followers that are excited about your product, you will always know more about your product than they do. So keep that in mind. Don't forget to be authentic. Use your real voice. Talk about the people on your staff. All right, more nitty gritty. Use images, use good images. Ideally, use fantastic high resolution, wonderful images. 
But when I do use images, we went through a phase a few years ago uh, where everybody in the media was saying this, was, this would be about the time when I stopped being a freelance journalist because everyone pivoted to video because this study had come out that said nobody reads newspaper articles anymore. Nobody reads the news. They watch videos on Facebook. Well, it didn't turn out until about three years later that that study was flawed. And by then, everyone was convinced and everyone had pivoted to video. So video, yes, important. Visuals, crucial. Absolutely crucial. You should have a very, very, very good excuse if your Facebook, Twitter, well, you can't have this. If your Facebook or Twitter posts do not have an image attached to them, there should be a very good reason. It should just be words. So make sure you're using very good images. Don't be afraid to repost things, too. If somebody wrote an article about you a while ago, put that back up on your wall every couple of months just to remind people that it's there. So we did a video drive through that's good uh, of your location, throw that up there, too. All the media sites are doing this. Curved posts their articles an average of once a month over and over again, the same things. So don't be afraid to repost something, especially if it's an especially good video that someone else took of you. If you get it in the media, put it on there and put it on there often. All right, some real world examples. So anybody really follow the DIA on Facebook and social media? They started a campaign just a couple of months ago when they take you behind the scenes, and it is fantastic. They show you the restoration. They show brief videos of someone pulling a painting out of a cardboard sleeve. They show intimate details of what's getting done. You have this opportunity. You have a perfect opportunity to take your social media followers behind the scenes and show them what it's like when the crowds aren't there. So imagine that you are in the loop and you are bringing your Facebook followers to look at the backside of the Mona Lisa. Have this opportunity to do it. Take advantage of it. Successful posts. Again, visuals. Use visuals. Uh, I worked with a marketing firm, and they did a study and found that the most successful Facebook photos that get posted, and again, I talk a lot about Facebook because this is what everyone is most used to and most familiar with. Uh, some of this carries across all the platforms. But the most successful photos are of a person looking almost directly at the camera. So people, even if it's you know a silly group like this, we're going to talk about humor in Facebook posts in a little bit. Uh, people, front forward. If the only picture you have of a person is up their back, don't bother. If you can't see the face, it doesn't matter. Unless you just want to show a vast crowd, but if you have a vast crowd of you see them, then your work is already done. Uh, videos, so native posts. What I mean by a native post is one that is posted directly, uploaded to the platform. So if you upload a video to Facebook, as opposed to putting a link to a YouTube video, it is 478% more likely to get viewed. Again, unless you have a very, very, very good reason to link, always upload the video. There's a little bit, there are different kinds of software, so if you get featured on the news, um, that's slightly different. If you're able to download the video and post the video, do it that way. People have become so lazy that clicking a link to go to a different site is too much work. Uh, hashtags, we'll talk about hashtags shortly. Um, the hashtag rules for Facebook are not the same as they are on Instagram, and they're not the same as they are on Twitter, and they're not as important, and we don't use them in the same ways. Don't be afraid to use humor, within reason. First of all, obviously, you have to be funny. But also, um, it's always better to put fun at no one at all, so um, never ever be mean. Never make fun of anyone, even if you think you're on the end on a joke. Uh, hashtags, you know, know your audience. Obviously, this is again for a women's clothing boutique. So they were just trying to get the word out that the fire department closed the Fisher building. Instead of putting up a sign that said, the fire department has closed the Fisher building, hot firefighters. Who doesn't love that? Among their audience. 
Hashtags tell stories. This is the kind of stuff that does go viral because it's funny, it's amusing, and it's using hashtags in an interesting way. Normally, I wouldn't recommend putting that many hashtags on a Facebook post, but if it does something clever like that, heck yeah, absolutely. That, that thing's been kicking around for years. Uh, be funny but never me. You know, we could have said awful things about this poor, sweet, ugly cat. Uh, but we didn't. Instead, we made up this kind of fabulous backstory about him uh, and, and about him ruling the world. So make sure you're keeping your humor lighthearted and again, assume your audience uh, is distracted at the very least. Be topical around holidays and extended campaign that focuses on a particular event uh, is, is, is a good way to build momentum with your engagement with customers or with, with followers. Be topical. Everyone's talking about the coronavirus right now. No one is talking about anything but the coronavirus right now. If you want to get attention, if you want to get media coverage, you have to tie in to what is topical because no one's publishing anything else. So you can't, if there's a delicate line, I would say, between being topical and stretching a little bit, right? We've all seen articles where it's like, this really doesn't have anything at all to do with the hot trending topic that you thought it did and it didn't quite work. So, you know, for you guys, coronavirus, absolutely post something about, you know, your museum, what the plans are, if you're gonna stay open, that kind of thing. Question? Yeah, real quick, do you have any uh, advice on, you know, National Blank Day? Uh, are those? Yes, it or, works. Or, yeah. and, you know, again, the National, that's one of the, yeah, so, National Puppy Day, I think is April 26th. Um, National Light to Work Day is May 15th. Uh, National World Wetlands Day is February 4th. I know all of these things because I've successfully pitched stories and gotten them covered by saying, well, it's Natural World, National World Wetlands Day. It does work. So get one of those National Day of calendars, uh, especially automotive stuff. You know, if you've got the car that Henry Ford won the 1910 race with, uh, put that out there on the anniversary of that day. Take advantage of that stuff. Follow the groups that do these things. So, especially on social media, you know, if it's National Puppy Day and you're an automotive museum, I don't think I'd use that. If you're an animal shelter, yes. So, the significant, relevant national days and international days, absolutely. Great, great, great way to get more people, more shares, more engagement. Uh, emotional appeals, you know, you're as a nonprofit, you are tugging at the nostalgia um, and, and the love for the past that the folks here have. So keep that in mind when you're using your language and when you're creating your messaging. You don't want to get super sappy or anything, but if you've got someone on your board who wants to go and you know talk in a brief video about how their grandfather used to have a 1947 Olds and that's why he got so passionate about this stuff, Use that, because that's a universal feeling. We all have this vision. It's part of the human condition. So take advantage of that. All right. Consider the platform. Um, if you write 250 words on an Instagram post, people are not going to read it. 250 on Facebook works sometimes. Twitter, I don't know if you can these days, I know you're off the limits, but uh, keep in mind what the market is and what the platform is. Instagram posts and Facebook posts just cross-share don't work as well as just tweaking it a tiny little bit. So consider, we're gonna consider the hashtag. So in Twitter, hashtags are everything, absolutely everything. You want to get on the trending topics, want to use one or two at a time, that's all. Use them smartly, use them topically, and then get you to the front of the page. Twitter, one really nice thing uh, about the platform is that all it takes is one or two really good tweets to get a heck of a large following. Nobody un unfollows you, so they just stop looking at you. But at that point, it doesn't matter. Uh, Facebook, storytelling. 
Facebook is still and always has been about telling stories. So this is when you build on your nostalgia. This is when you show the family visiting the car that looked just like the car grandpa drove. You, you tell the stories about the people and the things that are important to your followers. Instagram, gotta be pretty pictures. So if you have a professional photographer or a session, make sure you have permission to use those photos on Instagram. Um, take a look at, you know, just getting a little bit more into like camera angles and things like that, but try and be slightly unusual. Instagram, your hashtags are important for visibility as well. So if you're not really familiar with them, take 10 minutes, write down all the hashtags that you think might be relevant to your uh, group. So antique automobile, car museum, auto history, that kind of thing. Write those down and look them up. See how many people use that particular hashtag. That's important because I know a lot of people, especially people under the age of 40, go on Instagram and search only by hashtag. So they don't care if your product or if your photo isn't a part of what they're specifically looking for. And again, on Instagram, you can tell the stories with hashtags with the understanding that that's not going to get you any more followers. All right, event promotion. Who here is familiar with Eventbrite? Okay. How else do you get the word out? How do you get people from Facebook to buy tickets to your event? It's not an event, right? So it links to a website? No, Facebook put the link, the Eventbrite links in our Facebook event. Gotcha. Your event is still on Eventbrite though. Yeah. Okay. If you're not selling tickets to an event on Facebook, on Eventbrite, is there anything you do? Yes. Yeah. Set them up through constant contact. Constant contact? Okay. Good. Okay, a direct link to your website. Gotcha. And those are you know different platforms, different ways of paying for it. Um, Eventbrite is one tool that I think is a fantastic idea, but no matter whether you're using Eventbrite, selling tickets directly on Facebook, selling tickets on your website, or having them call, if you're promoting the event on, on social media, uh, you still are going to follow the same rules. Be clear. So the five W's: who, what, where, when, why how, but you don't need that. Put that information up top, front and center. Repeat it again at the bottom if it's a long description, but make sure it's up there. One of my biggest, and I think a lot of people's biggest pet peeves, if you're scrolling through Facebook and you see, you know, a great picture and it says, um, happy hour at the, you know, happy hour at, no, it just says happy hour when it's saying, I'll use my own organization to throw us under the bus. Happy Hour with Preservation Detroit. And that is all you see on that picture and on that event description. That doesn't tell me where it is or when it is. I'm not likely to click on that, even so far as to take it to the next Facebook event link because I, don't already, I already don't have enough information to make the decision. So make sure you're saying something like Happy Hour with Preservation Detroit at the Fort Cat plant. And then I'm gonna put the date on there. So you want the description of your event, the date, the time, and the place. Very clear, very front and center. Make the links really, really easy to follow. So if it is a long string letters, that is your website, or that is the link to get the tickets, figure out a way to make it shorter. There are websites like Bitly that shorten a link. It's gotta be short, it's gotta be clear. If you're making a little button, in so a uh, newsletter or on LinkedIn, make it way bigger than you think you need to because people are not paying attention. We're inundated with so much visual information that we're just not seeing it unless it's crystal clear to us. <coughs> be honest, and again, this goes back to be realistic. Um, don't have, don't enable comments if you're not able to respond to them. So make sure when you post this event on social media that you've got some time the day that it's been posted to respond to all the questions that are coming. Even if that just means making sure the phone is turned on and working correctly. Making sure your website's up and running, making 
you send people to websites for tickets, make sure that website's working. Uh, and repeat, nothing wrong with repeating a post about an event over and over again. In fact, um, one of the true standards of Facebook marketing from, for a long, long time has been events are one of the best things to post. Facebook loves looking important, so they love all the events that are on Facebook. So if you're gonna put $15 into promoting a post, do, do an event, promote an event, because that's got a call to action too. So it's easy to monitor the results. You know, if you're posting a beautiful picture of one of the cars in your exhibit, um, but there's nothing to do with the information, then you've sort of wasted money. So you want a call to action that is, that is clear and measurable. A few tools, um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but most of these are free um, to consider. So scheduling software, the number one complaint that we've heard from everybody here about social media and your biggest concern is having time to do it. So schedule things out. Just, you know, unless it is specifically topical to this day, there's nothing to say that you can't schedule something out. Facebook has scheduling tools. There's also software out there, like Buffer or Hootsuite or any of these others, some of which have free plans, where you can take an afternoon, create a bunch of posts, and you stick them in this website, and it schedules them out for you. So it's Saturday night, and you have no life, so you're sitting at home, and you've got two hours to create three weeks worth of contact. So what you can do is you can compose all that, set it in, and then schedule it out. If that's something that you or your staff are most worried about, that's very, very important. It's a great way to ensure the consistency that you're getting. Uh, event writing, we talked about that a little bit. Which scheduling tool do you prefer? I've worked with several. Um, I am by no means a technophile. So I will say I like Buffer. Um, I think they have a free plan if you have just one account. A lot of these scheduling softwares um, have, have different levels. So if you have just one user and one account, then it's free. But if you're trying to manage, as far as professionals, you know, across a bunch of accounts, Hootsuite works better. But that's only because I manage so many different accounts. If you've just got one person, one account, but that's personal choice. I recommend looking into all of them. Uh, Eventbrite, again, if you're not familiar with Eventbrite, it's a great way to uh, make everything easy and online for your event. They take a little cut of the ticket price, but uh, it's only like 2% for nonprofits, so that's not too bad. And they also do a lot of their own promotional stuff. Facebook likes them, so those things get shared more. Canva, anyone here familiar with Canva? Well, good. Uh, this, this presentation was actually composed on Canva. So uh, Canva is a free uh, software tool that's all online that you can create social media posts and presentations and posters and business cards or just about anything you can think of graphically um, for free with all of the material that they already have there. There are paid accounts that you can do as well where you get like super premium fancy stuff. But if you want to do a, an Instagram post where you have a picture and some type over top of it, you can do that. They have everything pre-formatted on the site, uh, so you can have nice looking graphics and, and, and all sorts of different ways. I recommend checking it out, especially if you are a one-person show as far as all your social media graphics and stuff like that. Um, there's a few others, but don't do a whole lot of time to get into them. Um, so since these are the three, I would say, platforms that nonprofits use, there's, there are a few different ways to consider it um, and, and to, to remind yourself that even though it is a pain and can be very frustrating, that it is important. Uh, this does, social media translates directly to dollars for nonprofits. It has continued to do so, it will continue to do so. Something like 43, but I'm not positive on that number, percent of giving Tuesday dollars come through Facebook. So social media, especially to the younger generation, translates into dollars.
In fact, more than half. So more than half the people who engage with nonprofits on social media take action. Whether that is get, uh, clicking a link to a ticket site, whether that's visiting an actual physical location, whether that's giving money. It, it does work. It, it creates, you know, your calls to action, so if you're creating a call to action, do create action. And almost 60% of the people that do take action are giving money. So finally, the keys to social media success, consistency, engagement in different ways, and consistency. Make sure you're doing well. Don't expect instant results. Unfortunately, the social media landscape is far too crowded right now. So make sure that you are consistently engaging and that will grow results, grow shares, grow benefits to you over time. Any questions? Nobody has questions? Yes? I saw a lot of good tips in there. Thank you very much. Um, one question on relative to the data on people taking the action based on their social media interaction. Where's that come from? Let me find a website for you. I do write it down, but I got it. Um, there, it's a not a nonprofit hub, but it's um, it's a it's a nonprofit uh, data white page that I've seen. So I love getting to that website. I didn't put put that in the presentation. I should have. Anybody else? Um, fun, I would finally like to encourage everybody. I know he's really hungry, but think about expanding your platforms. Everybody's on Facebook now, fewer and fewer people are joining Facebook, or people are leaving Facebook. Younger people are leaving Facebook. Instagram is huge. Look at Instagram, especially because all of you have a highly photogenic product. So use Instagram. It's simple. It really is. Um, look at LinkedIn. Look at, look at Pinterest. Look at Snapchat. Uh, Take a look at the other um, platforms. YouTube is also super easy to set up. So it, YouTube's also a great way to collect your, your information and your videos and just keep them there. So look at expanding onto other platforms. Yes, we all want to grow our Facebook reach and we've seen some good ways to do that, but make sure you're considering the other platforms as well. They'll become increasingly more important over the next few years. All right, if there are no further questions, I think we are good for lunch. Thank you.